Well, I've said several times that JSF enforces MVC, and I just want to illustrate how that can happen. We'll start off by reviewing very briefly what happens with JSP. So a request comes in to the controller. Now, this controller is a servlet, and it's a servlet that we write. Our controller servlet will then invoke one or more model components, which at the beginning of the module, we started off by making these servlets as well. Although in the last week or so, it may well be that you've started to make use of plain old Java objects, POJOs. Those model components produce data that may well have come out of a database and stores them in beans. And those beans are stored as attributes in one of the scopes, request, session or application. Then the controller will invoke the view, which in this case is a Java server page. And that JSP will get the data produced by the model from the appropriate scope and will then use the data in those beans when outputting its HTML content. Now in JSF it's very similar, although there are one or two notable differences. Watch very carefully the JSP and the model components. First of all, we note that the view is no longer a JSP but an XHTML file. And we'll also notice that the model components are no longer individual classes but are methods within what will be known as a backing beam. So the request comes in to the controller, but the controller is now generated by the framework, the Java server faces framework. That controller will, in some magical way, invoke the model components, and we'll talk about the magic in a bit. And then having invoked the model components, it will then invoke the view component. And the data that is produced by the model will be used by the view. So in a way, there's very little difference, but there is a big difference here, in that the model is no longer a servlet or a POJO, but a backing beam. And we'll see in a minute how that is done. So the important part here is that although MVC is enforced by JSF, we do not have any control over the controller servlet. So all we have to focus on is writing the view and model components. The view will be XHTML files, and the model will be backing beans and other Java classes. Let's take a look at this in the context of a simple application. Here we've got two views. Now starting off with planning the views is probably a good way of planning your, your internet applications because what we can do is plan with the user experience and then think about the server-side technology that will enable that user experience. Now in this example, we're going to start off with one view here, which simply asks the user to enter their username into a text box, and then when the form is submitted, there will be a transition to another view that simply echoes the value that was typed here. Now that's a very simple thing, but of course, there's, what we've got immediately is the concept of two separate views with a transition between them. Now of course, the transition is going to involve some server-side technology, so we start off with the first view when the button is clicked, submitting its form data to the controller. Remember, we have no control over the controller. It's provided by the JSF framework. That controller is going to update the model component, which is known as a backing beam. The backing beam is called user beam in this case. And so the form data will end up in a magical way that I'll explain later, now stored in the user beam. Then the controller will invoke the next view, which will get the information that's stored in the user bean and output it. So let's take a look at the code to see how that's done. We'll start off in index.xhtml. First thing to note is this is an XML file. With the HTML tag, we're nominating some XML namespaces. The first one is to give us the definition of XHTML, and the second one provides to us some HTML user interface components. Now this namespace is being nominated as H, a prefix. And that prefix is then used whenever I want to refer to that namespace. So here, for example, I am saying that I want to use the head element that is defined in the H namespace, the HTML namespace. And inside this head, there is a title tag, a standard HTML tag. Similarly for the body, and within the body, as well as some standard HTML, we've got from the HTML namespace, 
a form element. The next UI component is the input text component and we can see here that it is an, not only an input text but because it is this abstraction of a UI component it will be rendered in a way that is appropriate to the browser that is displaying the output. In this example here we can see that when I'm editing the text box there's a little cross on the right hand side of the text box. That's the way that Internet Explorer renders the input text UI component. If you use Google Chrome that will be rendered slightly differently in that there will be no cross on the right hand side. So that's an illustration of the ways in which the abstract elements can be rendered differently according to the browser type. The value of this input text is being linked to a property in the user beam and I'll talk more about how that happens in a few minutes. We've also got a command button which is also from the HTML namespace and that will be rendered as a button that will allow us to submit this form. The second view, page 2, we have again the head and body elements and now what we've got is an output text element. This allows us to display text not in a text box but just as ordinary text. But this is dynamic. This is allowing us to display text that is not static. The previous line, that's static text. That will never change. But this bit is dynamic. And its value that it will display is whatever that property in the user beam gives us. This element allows us to output a standard hyperlink. Now, in the user beam, this is an ordinary Java class. We've set it up as an ordinary Java bean, which means that we have a default constructor with a field and the standard get and set methods for that field. Now what makes this a backing bean is this annotation here, managed bean. That says that this class will be managed by the controller. Not only that, but the objects that are created from this class are going to be request scoped and that means that the instances of this beam are going to be stored in the request scope. 